our planet is surrounded by an atmosphere, a layer of air that is essential for life. The atmosphere seems thick when we look up and see all that blue, but compared to the size of the Earth, it's actually really thin. If Earth were the size of an apple, the atmosphere would only be as thick as the peel. An apple without a peel will shrink and wither. An Earth with no atmosphere would be incapable of supporting life. The fact that we live in air is pretty remarkable when you stop and think about it. We need air just like fish need water, only we're too heavy to swim. We live submerged in an ocean of air, and this material around us is important for more than just breathing. But what exactly is the difference between our atmosphere and outer space? I'm Science Mom. I'm Math Dad. Join us today to travel to the top of the atmosphere. Hello, thank you for joining us. If you are watching the replay or watching live as we broadcast from Nevada, today we are going to be learning about the top two layers of our atmosphere. We have three fun experiments, and then we have a where in the world mystery and some quiz questions for you to see what you learned. So let's start off by going to our notes. And if you're watching the replay, the notes are a free download that you can get. And we are going to go to page 10. 10 cool. and review really quickly the layers of our atmosphere. So last time we've talked mostly about these first three layers the troposphere, the stratosphere, and the mesosphere. And these first three layers are where 99% of the air molecules around our planet exist. So most of our atmosphere, in terms of the air molecules, is in those first three layers. But as we go higher and higher, the air molecules start spreading out more and more. And in the thermosphere and the exosphere, these layers are very tall compared to the others, but they do not have very many air molecules. And quick review, something important happens as we go from the troposphere to the stratosphere. In the stratosphere, the, weather, the air gets warmer as we go higher. But in the troposphere, the air gets colder as we go higher. And that's true in the mesosphere as well. The mesosphere is very cold. But why do you think the thermosphere has the name thermosphere? Ooh, thermometer, because that's where they make thermometers. That is not where they make thermometers. Any other ideas? They make thermoses? That is not where they make <laughs> thermoses, but thermo means heat. And the uh. thermosphere actually has the hottest temperatures in terms of how those air molecules are moving. Let's go back to our main really view, view real quick, and I want to explain this. Thermosphere, when I tell you the thermosphere has the hottest temperatures anywhere in the atmosphere, that's a little strange because if you visited the thermosphere, you would freeze to death. Whoa, 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 whoa. You would freeze to death at the hottest temperatures? Here's how this works. Imagine you have an <laughs> oven, an oven that is full of air. And let's say that it's full of billions and billions of molecules of air. You heat those up to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. When you open up the oven and the air comes out, what are you going to feel? Oh, I feel this huge heat wave. And you're like, ah. You do. You feel a heat wave when you open up your oven because it's full of so much air. But let's say that you only had one molecule of air in your oven and you heated that molecule of air up to 2,000 degrees Celsius. And then you opened up your oven door. If there was only one atom of air, let's say it was argon because all its friends are gone, just one atom of argon <laughs> heated up to 2,000 degrees Celsius. When you opened up your oven door, would you fill that molecule of air? Uh, no, most likely, because it's one molecule you're not going to fill. No, one molecule you're not going to fill. And most likely, that molecule is not going to hit you as it escapes from the oven. The thermosphere is the same way. The molecules mm. in the thermosphere are heated up to a temperature of about 2,000 degrees Celsius. It depends on the time of year and where you're at, but temperatures can get incredibly hot in the thermosphere. But those molecules are spread out so far that we actually wouldn't feel them. There's wow. not enough air for sound waves to travel in the thermosphere, and there's not enough air to transfer heat to you. It actually feels like a vacuum. Ooh, nice and cold. Nice and cold. And when we say vacuum, we're not talking about a vacuum like what you clean with. We're talking about the vacuum of outer space. So the absence of any molecules, that's what a vacuum actually is. Yes, Okay. exactly. Let's take, let's watch a really quick video that shows you the thermosphere. 
This is the International Space Station, Space Station, and it's traveling through the thermosphere. Does that look like you have a whole bunch of air molecules? Um, well, you can't see air usually, but yeah, it looks pretty It looks empty. pretty much like outer space, and it feels like outer space to us. And the layers that you can see below it, that's the troposphere, the stratosphere, and the mesosphere. Those layers have all the clouds, they have all the weather. The thermosphere is really a lot more like outer space. But a really exciting thing happens up in the thermosphere. You see, our sun is our best friend, but also our greatest enemy. Oh. The sun gives planet Earth life because it sends energy our way, and that's why photosynthesis right. works. That's why our planet is warm. But the sun also sends dangerous radiation out every single day. And without the atmosphere to block it, we would be in big trouble. Oh. And some of that dangerous radiation, when it hits the thermosphere, it splits atoms apart into protons and neutrons and electrons. And you have these charged particles floating around in the thermosphere. And if there are enough of them, sometimes the atoms of oxygen and nitrogen that get charged, sometimes they emit energy and they glow. Mm. And this is called... I know, I know this. Is it the Aurora Borealis? It is. <gasps> this is the Northern Lights. So this is happening mostly in the thermosphere, although the thermosphere sometimes changes how thick it is, how wide it is, and sometimes it can be a little bit lower, sometimes the northern lights can be a little bit higher, but most of the time they are in the thermosphere. Wow, so you've got all these ions floating up there, these charged particles. I've heard of the ionosphere, is that? Yes, and I have to say, when we're talking about the atmosphere, we have so many spheres. <laughs> we have the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, ionosphere, magnetosphere. There are so many different spheres that we can talk about, but the one that we're gonna focus on today is the thermosphere and the exosphere, both of which feel pretty much like outer space. And there's a quick little video that we made I wanna show you that sort of puts into scale just how thin our atmosphere is compared to planet Earth. So we made this to scale as much as we could. You can see the first three layers and then when we zoom up and you see how thick the thermosphere usually is, that's pretty, pretty Whoa. tall. And there's the International Space Station orbiting in the thermosphere and satellites orbiting in the exosphere. Now the exosphere is really, really big, but again, it's mostly empty space. It's mostly like the vacuum of outer space. Did, did you say that most of the the air was actually down in the bottom three layers? Yes, 99%, a little even higher than 99% wow. is in those first three layers. So when we talk about what the boundary is between air and outer space, that's actually a really hard question to answer because air is getting thinner and thinner as you go up higher and higher. And when we talk about the exosphere, where you just have a couple molecules of air every kilometer or so, it really feels a lot like outer space. And where does the exosphere end? Well, some scientists say it doesn't end until you get halfway to the moon. Oh, wow. That's enormous. And other scientists say, no, no, that really is like outer space. You know, it ends about a thousand kilometers above Earth. It all depends on who you talk to and what definition you want to yeah, use. There's no clear boundary. Though. There's no clear boundary. But the most common used boundary is actually right above the mesosphere. So I'm gonna go back to our notes real real fast on page 10. That's where the thermosphere starts. This is, above. yes, well this is the boundary where most people say outer space begins. Oh. Most people say that right here at about 100 kilometers, right above the mesosphere, most people say that's where outer space begins. So here you have the atmosphere and here you have space. That is one definition that people will use. But of course, the thermosphere is a little bit different than outer space. Okay. All right. There are two other pictures I want to show you really quick, and then we're going to go to our three experiments. All right. So remember, and this is super important to understand, air, air has weight. And air is full of molecules. If we're at sea level, we have lots of molecules. But if we go up higher, up towards the stratosphere, we don't have as many molecules. 
And that makes a big difference with how air behaves. We, we can't breathe at those higher elevations. We, we talked about that last time. Yes. So we cannot breathe in the stratosphere or the mesosphere or the thermosphere, especially. <laughs> but air down at sea level, air has weight. And I have a quick thinking question for you. Okay. I have a box here that is about a half of a cubic foot. So this box, if I were to fill it up with air, ta-da, it's full of air. How much does the air weigh? And one way to think about this is how much lighter would this box be if I took all the air out? Well, the air can't weigh very much, right? It's got to be just like some tiny number. Of it, it's going to be a pretty small number. Any, any ideas? How much does this weigh? If you're watching the replay, I want you to just take a guess, say it out loud. And if you're watching live, you can put a guess in the chat. How much does the air in this box weigh? And I think Math Dad's right. It's going to be less than a pound. So if we wanted to get a pound of air, how many of these boxes would we have to stack together? Yeah, I was going to guess it was less than an ounce even, but yeah, that's... Yeah. We've got some good guesses coming in. Melinda guesses that it's 0 0.0009 pounds, so less than an ounce. I'm seeing several other guesses that are also guessing less than an ounce. So it turns out that it's about 0 0.07 pounds. What we would need at sea level is 26 of these boxes together. 26 of those filled up would be one pound of air. Yes, if we got 26 boxes together, that would weigh about one pound of air. But if we travel up to Denver, Colorado, and we're a mile above sea level, then 26 boxes is no longer gonna weigh a pound. It's gonna be less than a pound because the air molecules are spread out more. Oh. Guess how many boxes we'd need, Math Dad? Do you have a guess? So uh, if we need 26 at sea level to make a pound, how many boxes are we going to need up in Denver, Colorado? 29. 43. Oh, wow. That's that's quite a few a more. more boxes. Yeah, 43 boxes in order to get a pound. And this is why you notice a difference if you travel from sea level to Denver, Colorado all at once, and then you get off the plane and you say, hmm, I usually run a mile in 10 minutes. I'm going to go run a mile right now. You are going to have a harder time running that mile because your body is not used to the air being so much thinner. So that, I mean, the, the amount that you as a person would weigh is almost identical at the two locations, but the air- The air pressure drops because those air molecules get spread, spread further up. apart. Uh -huh. And there's another way that we can make air molecules get spread further apart, and that is by heating up the air. So our first experiment that I'm going to do is called egg in a bottle. If you'll hold that egg math, Dad. I'm going to... This is a bottle, science sorry, mom. <laughs> if you hold the bottle for me, Math Dad, I'm going to light these candles on top of this egg. And when I light these candles, the air above them is getting hot. And it is going to get less dense. That means that those molecules are spreading out in exactly the same way the air molecules spread out at higher elevation. Watch what happens if we carefully... Whoops. My candles almost went out. Oh, one of them There did. we go. Sorry, I was trying to be helpful. I didn't want to burn the bottle. Here, I'm going to put them closer together so that other candle lights. Now they're lit up. Oh. Oh, no. We can do this. Okay, they stayed lit. Woohoo! And I'm going to stick the egg right in the bottom. The candles went out because they used up all the oxygen in the, the bottle. Egg. And the, the egg popped up into the container. Now, here's a question for you. Is there any way we can get this egg out? Or is it stuck in the bottle forever now? Because I'm not going to be able to shake it out. Wait, it's wait, but, but what just happened? What, one more time. What happened? The air inside this bottle got hot. And when it got hot, those molecules were spread out. They were further apart. And then when the candle went out and the air cooled down, now the molecules didn't want to be going <laughs> like this. They wanted to be going more like this. And so the pressure changed. Oh, wow. And the egg got sucked into the bottle. Was the oxygen burned away? The oxygen was used up and changed into carbon dioxide by the fire. Okay. Well, yeah. I just wondered if there was a vacuum going on there or not. Not a vacuum, just a difference in pressure. There was lower pressure inside the bottle, higher pressure outside. So the egg got sucked into the bottle, or we could think of it as the egg got pushed into the bottle by the air that's around it. And now it's stuck permanently. It's not stuck permanently. Watch what happens if I squeeze. Oh. Uh, if we squeeze slowly, not too hard because we don't want to break our egg, we can oh, get wow. it back out. 
pretty snazzy. All Should right. we try that one more time? Yes. All right, we're gonna do it one more time. Okay, so now, now we know what to look for. Now watch closely as we do this because when we put the egg into the bottle, as soon as the candles go out, that's when you're gonna see the egg start to move. And it happens pretty fast. And the reason that I blew was to try and clear out the carbon dioxide and to make sure that there was oxygen in here. Because I don't want our candles to go out immediately. There we go. And there they go. They go out. Math dead let go. <laughs> <laughs> and they go right into the bottle. It went. Nice. My second demonstration, Math Dad, is a million dollar bet. You ready for this? Do I get to win a million dollars? You do if you can do this. <gasps> so here's how this works. I have a bottle, okay. just an empty two liter bottle, and I have a little thing of toilet paper. I'm going to make a small little wad of tissue. <laughs> You're balancing that on your chin? Yeah, is, is that how I win the million dollars? No, bucks? that is not how you win the million dollars. Oh man. You win the million dollars by blowing this tiny little wad into the bottle. <gasps> so this doesn't seem very hard, right? I'm going to stick this right here on the edge. Let me turn so you can see it. See, it's balanced right there in the bottle. But here's the rule, you can't touch the bottle. I'm gonna hold it right like this. You just have to blow it inside. So I used to be poor and now I am rich. <laughs> Wait a minute. Do you want to try again? Yeah, okay, that, that, that was a warm up. Didn't count. I'll give you three tries. Do, do, do over everyone. <clears throat> and I'll even make I'll even make this little wad of tissue a lot smaller this time to make it a little easier for you, Math Dad. Okay, good. Now, this is super light. If I put it on my hand and blow, I can blow it really easily. I'm setting it right here on the edge. Come on, Math Dad, this should be an easy. All right, I'm gonna blow super hard this time. <gasps> what? And it came right out. It even okay. shot back and hit me. <laughs> Last <laughs> chance. Last chance, Math Dad. Let's see if you can do it. Okay, okay. So something's wrong here. Um. <clears throat> so is, you blew hard. Maybe you should try blowing soft. Do you think that'll help? There are a couple suggestions for that. All right, all right. Ch oh. Ch oh. I'm that, you didn't blow it in. Oh. You didn't blow it in. I accidentally pushed it too far. Okay. There we go. Oh, <laughs> blowing soft didn't work either. It didn't. It turns out this is an impossible challenge because of science. This bottle <laughs> is already full of air. And if you don't have the, the force blowing air connected to this, there's no way that you can blow that little piece of tissue paper in. You can try it. It's kind of like the air is bouncing off the air that's already inside the bottle. And the little piece of tissue is so light that as soon as the force of the air hits it, it hits the air that's already in the bottle and pushes it right out. Because oh, the only cool. the only way, remember that piece of air tissue is not blocking the entire bottle. There's a little gap above. The only way air can go into that gap is by pushing on air that's already in the bottle uh, and the air already in the bottle pushes that piece of tissue right out. Is it the Bernoulli principle as well? The, with the air flowing along the outside, creating a lower pressure? Uh, that might help just a little bit, but the main thing is that huh. the air's the bottle's already full of air. Oh, next time, my my hopes and dreams were crushed. So uh, your hopes and dreams, uh, hang on to those because our third one might make a little bit of a mess. Wait. We have we have one more experiment. We did two. Now we have a third. Hopes and dreams are those nightmares? Or what, what's, <laughs> what's, what's, what's going on? Don't worry, Matt. Dad. I put down <laughs> I put down towels on the floor because I know you don't like messes and we're gonna try to keep our floor dry. So I have a vase of water that I'm gonna pick up right here. And this vase of water is, it's pretty much all the way full. The water level goes right up here. In fact, I'm gonna fill it all the way to the top. There we go. It's completely full. Don't worry, Math Dad, the towel oh. is catching the water. Oh. I'm gonna put a piece of plastic on top and then I'm going to turn it upside down and let go on the bottom. <gasps> All that water is staying in the vase and the reason why is air pressure. There is pressure pushing on this lid and on the vase and on me and on you all the time. And it's about 15 pounds of pressure. So that means as long as this water doesn't weigh 15 pounds, I should be able to do this trick with an even bigger container. Should we try it? Um, Maybe. <laughs> oh. So here is here Careful. is this vase. 
Now let's try. <laughs> oh, guys. Oh, she's going to make a mess. Let's try a bigger container. Now, I don't have a plastic lid big enough to cover this, but I do have a cereal box. And if I take this cereal box and put it over the top and turn it upside down, it should work because the water in here and the lid combined, they don't weigh 15 pounds. They weigh a little bit less. Come on, Cheerios. You can do it. It's a little slippery. Whoa, but we did it. Woohoo! Oh, oh. It is staying. All right, Math Dad, I need your help. That's crazy. Flipping it back upside down. There we go. Should we try it with an even bigger one? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> oh. All right. You're making the chat nervous. We wouldn't want, wouldn't want to make them nervous. I think the chat is excited. I think Math Dad's the only one who's nervous. But they, they, you don't want to give them a heart condition. <laughs> <laughs> so this weighs even more. Let's see if we can get this one to work. And this one's heavy enough, Math Dad. I don't think I can hold it with one hand. So well, when I put maybe this, we shouldn't try. When I put this on top and turn it over, I want you to reach over and lift it up. So here we go. Oh. All right. Wait, what am I doing? Lift it up. Lift, lift this. Yeah, just lift it. Oh, it worked. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Ah. And then right behind you, Math Dad, I have a bucket. So if you can hand me that bucket, I tried to measure and fill this bucket up with what I thought would be approximately 10 and a half pounds of water. And then we're going to put this on top and see if it works. Oh, no, 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 science mom. Oh. Now, and I don't, I hope that this, this poster board will make a seal. We'll find out. We've never tried this before. Oh. All right, pick up the bucket, Matt, Dad. Hold the bucket. Good bucket, good bucket. Oh, it worked. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, the mess. But if I filled that bucket all the way full, because that bucket was not all the way full, it just had my my guess for what would be about 10 pounds of water. Um, <laughs> if I filled it all the way full, it would not work. Because if we get above 15 pounds of weight, then the air pressure, those billions and trillions of molecules that are pushing against us all the time, the air pressure would not be enough to hold it in. And if you try this demonstration at sea level, it's going to work differently at sea level than it is in Denver, Colorado, because in Denver, Colorado, ah. we don't have as much air pressure. <gasps> the air pressure is lower. Wait, so you've tried this in outer space. It totally wouldn't work. If you try this in outer space, it would not work at all. Uh -huh. In fact, if you tried this experiment in outer space, it wouldn't work either. Let's pretend just for fun. Let's pretend like we are on an actual space station and we have a handy little window here that we can open up and push things out into outer space really fast. And if we had our egg experiment happening, let me get my egg back out. Come on, egg. If we had our egg experiment and we had just lit the candles and we put it right like this where we knew it was gonna get sucked up into the container and we immediately put it into the vacuum of outer space, what would happen? So there'd be more, there'd be air in the bottle, but not outside. But not outside. So the air would push the egg out? It would, it would push the egg out. Pretty cool, right? Egg missile. You would, you would make a, <laughs> you would make a little egg missile if you put it into the vacuum of space. All right, so Neptune 36 wants to know what would happen to the water in outer space? If we took water that was a liquid and put it out, it would immediately start to boil. In fact, we have a video that we want to show you real quick of what happens in a vacuum. And we're not talking about a vacuum cleaner, we're talking about a vacuum of empty space. There are vacuum chambers that we have as scientists we can use to suck out all the air. So this is a vacuum chamber and there's water in it. The water is not hot, it's room temperature water, but watch what happens as the air gets pulled out. The water starts to boil. And you don't see bubbles coming up from the bottom. It's boiling from the top because all of the liquid water is starting to turn into a gas because there's no pressure. Isn't that awesome? That, that's crazy. But the, the temperature of that water, was it was getting really hot or not? It was not getting hot. What? I mean, maybe, maybe the molecules were starting to move around a little bit faster and were getting slightly warmer, but the temperature of the water, the liquid water, it was not boiling. It what? was, well, I should, I should, I need to rephrase that. It was boiling at room temperature. Boiling means turning from a liquid to a gas. And that was happening 
but it was not happening at 100 degrees Celsius. The boiling point lowered with the pressure. Exactly. Crazy. So that, that's what would happen to the water if we were trying to do this in outer space. Not to mention, there wouldn't be any gravity pulling it down. That, okay, it would just be a weird experiment to try in the vacuum of space. If anything liquid that you take into the vacuum of space will immediately turn into a gas. And it won't get hot and turn into a gas. It'll turn into a gas at a relatively cold temperature because outer space is quite cold. But it's not going to stay liquid because there's no pressure in space. We live on Earth. We live in an atmosphere and we need pressure. We need that 15 pounds pushing in on all directions. Is this an experiment that they can try at home? The um, turning a lid upside down? Yeah. Yes. But always, before you do experiments at home, always check with your grown-up first. Make sure you have permission. I'll tell you, doing it in a bathtub might be a better idea. Would soap affect the experiment? Um, soap does make it so that, that whatever you're putting to make a seal doesn't seal quite as well. And so it's a little more difficult with soap, but it, it will still work as okay. long as you don't have too much weight. All right. Are you guys ready for our mystery? Because each time we have a where, where in, in the, the world? world mystery, and this is your, your clue also to make sure to get item pool up so you can participate in the poll. So our mystery to place today is a, a volcanic island. Its native name is Rapu Nui, the mm. home to Moai and hundreds of big headed statues. Where in the world is this place? I think I know it because of the big headed statues and not because of any of the other clues. The big headed statues is quite the giveaway. <laughs> Do you want to go ahead and say it? Or are you waiting for I was gonna, I was someone in the chat? For, no, it's going to be Easter Island, right? You are correct. It is Easter Island. Easter Island, and this is the drawing that is in the notes that you can match it with. Page 30. Is belongs to Chile. Chile is the country that has claimed this location. But look how far away it is from Chile. Oh, my goodness. That's more than 2,000 miles away. It is one of the most remote islands in the world. And it is home to a lot of really large statues called Moai. That drawing on the one side is from the 1800s when the island was first discovered. And then the, those are several famous ones that you can see along sort of one of the main paths on the island. Cool fact about Easter Island, it used to be populated with a, a tribe of people. But when it was discovered in the 1800s by European explorers, not a single person lived on the island. And there was not a single tree on the island either. And archaeologists think that the reason that people abandoned Easter Island was because they cut down every tree. And once the trees were cut down, so then they couldn't make boats to fish, and everything collapsed. Oh, no. It's kind of like the Lorax. Yeah. Or... Don't cut down all the trees. Bad idea. All right. Let's oh. pull up item pool. Wait, wait, wait. Before we... I've got a question. Okay. Oh, yeah. Vacuums kind of suck things out, right? Or maybe maybe the vacuums don't suck. Maybe it gets pushed. Air, the... air pressure pushes. You can think <gasps> of it both ways. So our vacuum cleaners don't actually suck the stuff up. The air is just pushing it in. That's kind of a weird thought. But okay, why doesn't all the air just get sucked into space? Because space is a vacuum. Oh, this is Checkmate, a really good, science mom. really good question. And the answer is because of gravity. Earth is so big that it has gravity pulling everything in towards the center of the Earth. And if you were at the North Pole and you drop something, it falls down. If you are at the South Pole and you drop something, it falls towards the Earth, which relative to the North Pole, you know, you can kind of think of as being up. Everything goes towards the center of the Earth. And the atmosphere is kept around our planet by gravity. And also it's protected by the magnetic field, which we'll talk more about when we get to our geology section. Good All question. Right. And now it is time for item pool. Okay. And while Math Dad does our first question in item pool, I'm going to run grab science puppy really fast. I will be right back. All right, so head over to itempool.com slash science mom slash live. And if you can answer these questions. And if you decide, or if you're unable to do that, by all means, make sure you're answering them and do it out loud so that somebody can, can hear that yeah, commit to an answer. All right, for our first question, where is the atmosphere the hottest? Is it the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, or the thermosphere? Mm-hmm. Which layer is the hottest? Watching those votes come in. Oh, man, 49. 
54, lots of votes I'm seeing here. 60, uh, one category is going to win. Okay, you guys, maybe this, this was an easy one. You got, you got to start with an easy question. So yeah, they might get this one right, but they'll, they'll get stumped. Don't worry. I've got science puppy here. Hey, Kaladin. All right, let's go ahead and finish and reveal. <gasps> And the chat says it's the thermosphere. And thermosphere is correct. And again, this is not where it would feel the hottest to us, but it's where the temperature is the hottest based on how the molecules are moving. And the thermosphere is incredibly hot in terms of how much energy those air molecules have. Kind of, kind of crazy to think of that we would feel cold there. Well, but because, even though that's the hottest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And the height of the thermosphere changes a lot based on time of year and on how active the sun is. Sometimes it's super thick, sometimes it's thinner. All right. In which layer of the atmosphere do we find the auroras, the aurora borealis and the aurora australis? The northern and southern lights. Mm hmm There's fancy words. I always feel fancy when I say those. Those Latin probably? Yeah, and it means dawn of the north and dawn of the south. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Yep. Galileo was the one who named the Aurora Borealis. He was a pretty cool guy. Go Galileo. Yep. All right, so is it the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, or the thermosphere? And I will say, depending on, so if you look this up and fact check it later, depending on solar activity, where we see northern lights, the elevation can change. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, but there's one layer where we see them most often, and that's the correct answer. All right. All four possible answers are getting some, some traffic here. Ooh. Let's go ahead and reveal. And the chat says thermosphere. Thermosphere is correct. Next question. Nicely done, guys. Nicely done. All right. In which, oops. Which layer of the atmosphere is the top of Earth's tallest building? Okay, yeah. The Earth's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa, is ridiculously tall. I don't know that I'll ever get a chance to see it in my life, but incredible that we could possibly build something like this. So the very top of that building, is it in the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, or the thermosphere? Hmm. Ooh. Did you just yawn? I think he did. Are you bored? Am I boring you? He's sleepy. I went and got him. He was yeah. asleep. That can happen. All right. Go ahead and finish and reveal. I know we've still got some answers coming in. And the troposphere said, is correct. So the troposphere at the very bottom layer, definitely, it, it, it goes like 30,000 feet high, almost 10 kilometers. The top of the tallest mountains are also in the troposphere. Most of our weather, all of the clouds, those take place in the troposphere as well. Yeah, kind of Next crazy. One. All right. Ooh, this one is a tricky one, and I want you to just give your best guess. So I've, got, I've got a picture here of Carnegie Hall, which is massive. And the question is, um, basically, how much air does Carnegie, how much does the air in Carnegie Hall weigh? So if we were to fill it up, there's this giant, pretty famous auditorium. Yeah, that main auditorium can seat more than 2,800 people. So it's really a big room. And you can see from that picture, the ceilings are really high. How much do you think all of the air weighs? Zero, Zero pounds, pounds, 250 pounds, 1,800 pounds, 70,000 pounds. I mean, that's a, an awful lot, but. Take a guess. Yeah. And just take your best guess. Don't worry if you don't have time to crunch the numbers and do the math. No, no. We're, just take take a guess. We haven't, we haven't given you enough information to do any real math here, but, but yeah, some in intuition. And I guess we, we did kind of talk about the, the boxes or earlier and how many boxes it would take to weigh one pound of air. That's right. All right, let's finish and reveal. I'm real curious about this one. All right. This is the one I'm going to stump them on, Science Mom. They said C. They said 1,800 pounds. It was the most popular. <gasps> the then, answer is actually 70,000 pounds, you guys, which that's is crazy. crazy. That is so much. So here's one way to think about it. it how many boxes? <laughs> of this size could you fit in Carnegie Hall? Carnegie Hall is big enough, it turns out the answer is about 2 million. And all of the air together, it weighs about 70,000 pounds. If you took all of the air out of Carnegie Hall and made it a vacuum, it would weigh 70,000 pounds less than what it weighs right now. Yeah. All right, do I get a victory dance for that? You do.
All right. Are you going to do it right now? <laughs> yes, but I, I'll start the next question here. So if you poured out a bucket of water in outer space, what would happen? So the, what would the water get cold and freeze solid? Would the water become hot and boil away? Would the water get cold and boiled away? Or marmoset? <laughs> There's a non sequitur for you. My All right, math dance. dad, enjoy your victory dance. <laughs> and I have to say, that was kind of a sneaky question to get your victory dance on. But <laughs> it's a fun one. And I bet everyone is going to remember that air, if you add up a lot of it in a really huge space, it actually weighs a lot. It's kind of weird to think of. Yeah. It, so but... next time you're in a, you know, you see a football stadium or anything else where it's a really huge space, mm. imagine to yourself, there's <laughs> you know, maybe even a hundred thousand pounds of air in a big space like that. Oh, football stadium. Football I mean, stadium would be millions, even larger. Yeah. yeah. All right. The votes are in, and the chat says that the water would get cold and boil away. Exactly right. So the water's not going to get hot and boil. It's going to boil at whatever temperature it's at, and when it goes into the vacuum of outer space, it could even get colder as it's boiling away, which is remarkable. So th this is why we wouldn't want to be outside without a spacesuit in space, right? Exactly. So this is why any, you, any liquid in you would try to boil. Would and that, start boiling, yeah. That's bad. That's really <laughs> bad. That's really bad. This is why outer space is so dangerous and deadly and why people only visit outer space with heavy-duty spacesuits and or in a actual rocket or shuttle that is protected and has air inside it. And in case you're wondering what Marmoset was there, uh, it's just one of the default answers when I'm building the questions. And in one of my classes, I forgot to remove the word marmoset. So I've left it in as a joke. And they keep teasing me about it. I might as well tease them back. Science Bob Jamie wants to know if the marmoset has a space suit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have several excellent questions that have come in. I'm going to answer um, as many as I can in the next couple minutes. Good question about the egg in the bottle trick. Was the egg hard boiled? Yes. The egg absolutely has to be hard boiled and peeled because it has to be able to bend just a tiny bit as it goes up into the bottle. And actually, what size of egg is that? This is a medium size egg. A medium size egg works really well for this standard size of larger bottle opening. A large egg is actually too large. And when it gets sucked up, it will break into smaller pieces. Mm. It will break as it goes in. This is a really, I'm so glad you asked because if you tried this with a raw egg, it would well, probably wouldn't work, but even if it did, it'd be messy, right? So, good question. It would be hard to stick candles into a. And what type of bottle well. is that with the right size opening? Um, I think this was a V8 bottle, but just any. This is kind of the standard larger bottle size. So obviously, a a pop bottle with the smaller opening is going to be too small. You just need the next size up. Okay. Um, and then a great question from Elizabeth: Are you skydiving in that video in the beginning, or is someone else? Mm. That was someone else. And that's what my daughter said too when she saw the video. She was like, when did you go skydiving and how come we didn't know about it? No, we, um, that's from just stock footage. Um, Quinn asks, is the heat of the thermosphere what makes meteors melt? Excellent question. And it is actually the speed of the meteors that makes them melt. It's how fast they're going. If somehow you were able to drop a rock up into the mesosphere and have it not be traveling as fast, I mean, it's, and it's going to start traveling faster and faster as it's going down. But if it were not traveling fast, it would not melt or heat up at all. Mm. It, meteors, when they enter the Earth's atmosphere, are typically traveling at speeds that are almost unimaginably fast. We're, we're talking way faster than anything else moves on our planet. And as they hit those air molecules... They're hitting the particles. Yes, the, the friction of the air molecules hitting them, that's what makes them heat up and then burn up. Very good so, question. Great question. I'll ask, answer just a couple more. Um, um, Amaya asks, if there was artificial gravity on the International Space Station, then could you run a mile with the same reaction as if you ran a mile on Earth? This is a great question. And I'll answer, um, if you were on a treadmill, you actually don't need artificial gravity. If you were on a treadmill, as long as you have the same air pressure that you're used to, your body's going to perform pretty much the same way. So if you can run on a treadmill on Earth, you can run a mile in 10 minutes. Then a treadmill on the space station, your performance is going to be pretty similar. But, and you can Google this if you want, but when astronauts run on treadmills in space, they actually have to have straps on their waist to keep them on the treadmill. It, well, is artificial gravity a thing? It could be. We haven't created artificial gravity yet. But if you had a space station that was spinning, mm -hmm. then centrifugal force 
or centrifugal force would push people toward and things toward the outside of the spaceship, and you could kind of mimic you could gravity mimic on. gravity that way. Gotcha. Okay. Right. What about the coldest place in the atmosphere? Oh, great question, Amy. The coldest place in the atmosphere is the mesosphere. So the top layer of the the mesosphere temperatures get down way below zero and like negative 89, 90 degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius, sorry. That's the coldest place in the atmosphere. And then the thermosphere and exosphere, both of those, the molecules are getting so much radiation from the sun that they actually have a lot of energy. And we say the temperatures are high, even though it is almost a vacuum. And then um, last question, um, a clarification from Abby. If you drop something in the South Pole, it falls up. This is a great question. So <laughs> if you drop something anywhere on Earth, it will fall towards Earth. But if you are looking at Earth from outer space, the directions that something falls from the North Pole and the South Pole, technically, if you're watching from outer space, it's Look, opposite. Opposite. <laughs> yeah, because they're, they're both going towards the Earth. But things always fall down towards the Earth. Uh, uh, Natalie asks an interesting question about the million dollar challenge. Did the size of the opening in the bottle matter? That is a great question, and let's test it out right now. Mafta, I'm not offering you a million dollars for this one, but see, this container has a much bigger opening. Yes, it does. Let's see what happens if we carefully balance this little ball of tissue paper right there. Can Mafta blow it in? Nope. nope. <laughs> so, okay. I wonder if we did, there's a really big opening, if, I, if that would work, or if... I, I think it's still, once air starts to go in above, that little thing of tissue paper, I think it's going to bounce it back out. But what if we do a small one and what if you blow softly? Still comes out. No. Yep. So a, this would be a fun one to experiment with. All right, we, um, we are out of time, you guys, but thank you so much for joining us. And before we go, I do have a couple special birthday shout outs that I wanna do real fast. So a super happy birthday to Dane Jr. who had a birthday last week, to Aubrey, to Liam in Alaska, who turned 11 yesterday, to Emin Van Dayen, who turns 11 today. Happy birthday, Ooh. Emin. To Lindy, who turns 10 tomorrow, and to Margot Sanchez, who has birthday today. Happy birthday, you guys. We Indeed. hope you have a wonderful day. Work hard, grow smart, and we'll see you Friday.